I think we're uh, I think we're good for day two. Everyone feel rested from yesterday? Yeah, we're feeling good. Yesterday was just the warm up for today. Today's the real, the big challenge. No, no, today should be good. It's actually a little less busy, right? We just got a nice solid module in the morning, nice solid module in the afternoon, no student talks. Just gonna get down to work today. Um, so yesterday went fairly smoothly uh, and I, I think today we should go good as well. I tried to cut down some of my slides because I think um, we had some pretty good questions yesterday. And so a lot of people coming at probably metagenomics from different angles. So I, I'd encourage you to ask questions again, just, just like yesterday. And I think that'll, that'll be really a benefit for everyone. Okay, so with that, we can get into things. Okay, so uh, we're gonna be talking about metagenomics and learning objectives uh, are fairly broad here. So basically I'm gonna start with just contrasting metagenomic from Amphicon sequencing. I think we have a pretty good handle on that, but that's always good to understand. Then we're gonna describe sort of uh, general approaches for taxonomic assignments. So this is very similar, I guess, to what we did yesterday with 6 s right? Trying to assign taxonomy. But obviously metagenomics is different and so there's uh, different challenges and there's different approaches for that uh, and then today will be our first jump into you know microbial functions so not just looking at uh, taxa but also at microbial functions and how we you know what we mean by microbial annotation of functions and and different approaches for that as well now if you thought there was a lot of options yesterday for 16s there's going to be everything today is going to be like well yep yeah, you could do that or you could do this, or you could do that. So 16S actually has a pretty solid workflow, I would say, some variation in there. Metagenomics is pure freedom almost in that you can do a lot of different things uh, and a lot of cool different things. And so I possibly can't even talk about them all you know, in this lecture, uh, but happy to talk uh, obviously through questions and, and during breaks and things. Okay, so yesterday with 16S, we all really understand that. It's well established. Um, it's real, relatively inexpensive, right? We talked about that sort of, depending on where you get your sequencing, sort of $20, $40 a sample. And that's because you don't need a lot of sequencing reads, right? You might need 50, 100,000, maybe more, depending on what you're doing. Um, uh, and we talked about how 16S or other amplicon sequencing only amplifies what you want, right? depending on the primers you choose, you are sort of selecting what you're gonna get back. Whereas metagenomics now is really this idea of just sequencing all the DNA in a sample, right? I mean, we can talk about different ways to maybe enrich for certain organisms, but at the heart of it is that there's no specific primers going towards a certain gene or target, right? It's just taking DNA, extracting it all and, and sequencing it. So that's great. We don't have to worry about then, you know, what our target is. There's no, in theory, there's no primer bias. Um, the other big benefit is, whereas before we sort of had to pick about, you know, what microbes we're going after, in theory, we get a whole picture of all the microbes in that environment. So we can study viruses, we can study microbial eukaryotes if they're there, we can study bacteria and archaea. Other big thing is probably, uh, it's widely accepted that you would get better resolution, better taxonomic resolution. So we talked about like say 16S getting down to maybe that genus level with metagenomics, we can often get down to a species level and maybe even sort of some strain identification, depending though, of course, on lots of factors about the depth of sequencing and, and how dominant that organism is in the sample, but usually better taxonomic resolution. The downsides of course is that it's more, more expensive Right, so we're gonna we're gonna sequence a lot more. So for a typical maybe metagenomic experiment, you're talking about five to ten million reads. It's not uncommon to hear people sequence maybe a hundred million reads, depending on really the platform that you're sequencing on, and the environment that you're looking at. So because of that, you're going to incur the cost of that extra sequencing. So now we're talking about you know price range of a hundred to maybe one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars a sample, depending on on sort of what you're what you're looking at. Um, the other big benefit is that besides just identifying sort of who is there, it also identifies functions, microbial functions. So you can think about, you know, just what the, what those microbes are doing, which is really a different lens on it. Uh, and then the other really big thing is that you can reconstruct genomes. And so that's going to be the topic for this afternoon about how we can try to, you know, put the pieces back together uh, and assemble genomes. 
And there's probably other advantages here to metagenomics that go beyond, but that's sort of our, our main contrasting points. So I thought I'd just sort of lay out some of the different techniques uh, or broad approaches that you might think about using metagenomic data for. So one is this uh, process where we basically use reference databases and map our reads to those databases to come up with tables of either taxonomic information or functional information, right? So this is kind of similar maybe to what we think about yesterday and is probably the, in one form or the other, what we do in a lot of cases, right? We have our reads, we're gonna do filtering, we'll talk about that. We have some database, you use some sort of mapping software to get to these. And then you end up coming up with, you know, new tables of say taxa, particular functions. Um, and then you would then do downstream analyses on those tables. Some of the same approaches that you would have learned yesterday about alpha and beta diversity, but you can also do a lot more interesting things with like networks and co-occurrence. Uh, but yeah, so that's sort of one broad approach. And that's primarily what we're gonna focus on this, this morning is, is this sort of approach. There are other approaches out there. So if you're really interested in like specific genomes, I know there's a few people in here like that were studying sort of like, uh, you know, particular pathogens and understanding whether the presence or not. And so there's different approaches you can do for that as well, where maybe you have a genome of interest, you're really focused on that. And then you can start to use your metagenomic data and map to it to find out one, is it really there and two, you know, the genome I have, is there differences with what maybe the genome that's in the, in the sample. We tend to see still mags probably dominate this approach a bit, but still quite useful. Um, probably the least, I don't see this approach as much, we should call it fragment recruitment, but it does give you an idea essentially if, you know, if you have good coverage of your genome, whether there's parts that might be missing, suggesting that that genome is different, uh, and whether there's, you know, just maybe sparsity on that genome and, and it is or is not there. And then the topic, which we're not going to talk about this morning, but this afternoon, I already alluded to, is this idea of reconstructing genomes. And so with this, really what we're trying to do is, you know, take our raw reads, assemble them into contigs, bin them, and hopefully do some quality assurance and get back to essentially, you know, where we started with the original genome. And of course, the advantage there is that we're not culturing, right? We're just literally taking samples, very high throughput. Uh, it's noisy and problematic, but but uh, it's very attractive in that we're, you know, we're skipping all that culturing step. So Laura will talk about that this afternoon. So let's just jump right into what we're going to do is I'm going to split the talk sort of into taxonomic profiling first and then functional profiling after that. Okay. So for taxonomic profiling, you know, we're, we're trying to take this raw data uh, and we're trying to get to a similar table like yesterday uh, with taxa by samples. So there's many challenges identifying taxa from metagenomics data. So one, obviously the reads are randomly assorted. We understand that. The reads are usually short, usually. Uh, it depends if you have maybe long read data, but usually they're shorter. We're talking about 100, 150 base pairs, right? So you can imagine if we're not assembling that, there's limited information to say this piece of short DNA came from this organism. We might have uh, spotty genome coverage due to sequencing depth. So even though we sequence quite a bit, you're never gonna be able to sequence, you know, all the organisms in your sample, unlikely, to an adequate depth where you get very good coverage across all your genomes, right? So if you think about the most dominant organisms, sure, we might have pretty good genome coverage. And then there's gonna be a long tail of more rare things. And we're not gonna have really great coverage on those. So for some organisms, we're really gonna have you know, tens or maybe hundreds of reads to that to that genome. And so we're relying on that information. I mean, that's, again, doesn't, doesn't go for all cases, right? I mean, you might have a very well-defined system with only a few taxa, but in most cases we have hundreds to thousands of taxa. Uh, for taxonomic I mean, lateral gene transfer, it isn't really talked about a lot, but it's obviously a really big problem, right? So if you have a short piece of DNA, and you're trying to annotate that it came from a certain genome. If that piece of DNA was recently horizontally acquired from another uh, genome, then that might not, it would be, a, it would be uh, misleading, right? 
because essentially it looks like it's from this genome, but it actually was horizontally transferred into a different genome. And so horizontally transferred DNA, you know, aren't really great as a, say, a marker or an indicator that the taxa is there. And then the biggest thing really, I guess, is probably computational time. So unlike 16S data, where it's pretty manageable, I know we skipped over a couple of steps yesterday, but the reality is, is you could probably install chimes on most of your laptops, you could probably process a chime, like a 16S data set in a reasonable amount of time on a reasonable computer, right? My genomic data is much larger, right? So a lot of reads and then the databases are very large too. And so that actually just has real restrictions on the approaches we have to take. So the computational methods will use heuristics, they'll use approximations to make them faster, but of course they're not as perfect that way. It also means that for many tools, you're not gonna be able to probably do it on your, on your laptop, right? So there are some tools, we'll talk about the difference later, that you could, but you might have to go up to something a bit beefier, right? So you might have to get access to, you know, a, a cluster somewhere, whether it's an AWS instance that you're purchasing, or maybe you're going to CompuCanda, which is now called the Digital Alliance, right? They, they offer computational clusters for free, or whether you know somebody with, you know, high performance computing. But we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Okay, so for the taxonomic side, let's talk about some of the initial bioinformatic processing steps. I'm not going to talk about, you know, repetitive things here. So many of the same filtering we talked about yesterday with 6NS data applies to metagenomic data. Usually the first thing you're going to try to do is get rid of reads that just don't look high quality, right? They just, you might as well get rid of them early. It speeds up things downstream, plus they don't, they don't come through the other end. So you would apply different, uh, different filtering techniques on that data. So you would de also demultiplex, do some lane merging. I uh, was talked about stitching reads yesterday and I talked about this already, but usually with metagenomic data, we don't join reads, right? They don't overlap usually. And so because of that, if you're say using Illumina data, again, you would just take your forward reads and your reverse reads. And in most applications or many applications, you would just simply combine them into one file. Some tools will, take the, the forward reads and the reverse reads and know what to do with them. But at some point, probably in your pipeline, you'll end up um, merging them together, okay? We can talk about that a little bit more later, but the only tools I really use them that I know of are, are actual like DNA mappers like BWA or Bowtie. They know how to handle the forward and reverse reads, but a lot of other similarity tools don't. Okay, so what's unique here with metagenomic data is a couple of, sorry, is really this idea of removing unwanted, uh, what I call host associated reads, right? You can think of this as maybe contamination, but I don't think, I think contamination people think of, of other things. But essentially for many studies, not all again, like uh, many of your reads will be associated with some sort of host. So if it's human, that would be, us humans, but you could be studying bats, it could be a plant uh, microbiome interface, anything where there's a lot of DNA coming from a source that you really don't want in your analysis, then you might want to consider removing that DNA. So something for like human stool, no problems at all. Human stool is mostly bacterial DNA. You can do a filtering step, but it's not going to lose too much. Let's say if we're talking about saliva or skin microbiome, or if you have like a plant associated microbe where you're taking parts of the leaf, you know, those eukaryotic cells have a lot of DNA in them. That means they get sequenced quite a bit. And now all of a sudden, it's not uncommon to see a large portion of your sample have sort of host associated reads, right? So for oral microbiome, we're talking sort of 50 to 80% of the sample of the DNA that you sequence would be host associated, would be human associated, right? Uh, and it's a limiting factor of metagenomics. It's probably one of the only real downsides to it besides cost is the added cost if you have a lot of host con contaminated DNA, right? So it sounds great to do metagenomics, but if you, know, you have 80, 90% of the DNA being host and you have to throw that away, well then in theory, you have to sequence a lot more to get to get enough microbial reads. 
Okay, so to do that is fairly, you know, straightforward, especially if we have the genome. So for humans, we have human genomes. For mice, we have mice genomes. For plants, some plants, we have their genome. If you don't have it, you know, if you're studying something more exotic, like, I don't know, it's exotic nowadays. Dolphins? Is there a dolphin genome? I feel like there probably is. I don't know. Uh, so, you know, if you don't have the host genome, that's problematic. You're probably going to want to take, you know, the nearest phylogenetic neighbor and try to map against that. Um, and then usually you just use what we call a DNA mapper. So these are pretty common, Bowtie 2, BWA, it's fairly straightforward. And usually uh, parameters around that, we want to be fairly lenient, right? Because we want to make sure we any reads that really tend to map to that genome, we just want to take them out. Um, and then I also usually mention PHIX is often used as a sequencing control. Sometimes we see it still a little bit left over. It should be removed by the sequencer with Illumina, but sometimes we still see it. So we end up usually including that in our database of things to screen against. Okay, so does that make sense on the screening thing? Pretty straightforward. Yes, John, not straightforward. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if everyone heard about it, but it's about sort of ethics and this fact that if you do human genome sequencing, or sorry, human microbiome, you're going to get a lot of reads to the human genome, right? And that causes a bit of a problem for ethics sometimes. Um, and just thinking about how to handle that situation. So it is true. Um, actually, we had a study a while back where we actually used, we did biopsies of intestinal samples for IBD. We actually used like the 90% of the reads for the human genome that mapped to it. And instead of just throwing them away, we actually used it to genotype the individuals, right? And we came up with like known risk factors for IBD and then combined that with microbiome data. So there's a lot of strength there. And then recently there was a paper that, uh, just hold on, my brain's not functioning yet. Um, used the, what was it now? I don't, I'm drawing a blank, but what I was going to talk about. But they used the human sequencing. Oh, what was it? I don't know. Oh, it was a privacy concern. So they show that you could use the human sequencing to identify the individual from the microbiome sequencing. So from an ethics consideration, it's been sort of, uh, I guess it depends on who your ethics board is. <laughs> so ethics boards tend to be, uh, you know, microbiome is cool, they don't care. And as, all, as soon as you say you're sequencing human genome, ethics boards get very like, they have a lot of rules for that. that that's my experience. Uh, and then for most people to get a rat, I should never say get around, the, the way to handle that is to clearly say in your ethics that you're going to remove those human reads, uh, possibly discard, and then if you're gonna upload the data, you would be uploading raw data, but that's only microbiome. That's only microbial in the hopes that all the human sequences were filtered out. That's how I've seen almost all those cases applied. And most ethic boards seem to be pretty happy with that approach. Yeah, yeah question? Do you have a strategy for mitigating um, barcode hopping? Uh, for mitigating, what was it, sorry? Barcode oh, like hopping rigs? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, so this idea of a barcode hopping is interesting. So the idea is that, uh, as we talked about, like with bar barcoding samples and multiplexing, it's been shown that sometimes you will, can get barcode hopping. So the idea is that somehow you have a sample that's barcoded, but the the uh, the barcodes and sort of like how they get attached get they hop to the other samples when they're combined. Um, it's an interesting problem, uh, and I would say most people don't worry about it. I think because at the level it's at is fairly low. It does mean it's problematic in that. Um, if you have very uh, different types of samples, you know, you might be able to identify those, right? So if you're multiplexing like human versus ocean or some sort of like water, you can maybe pull those out, but there's not, there's not a great solution, no. 
And it, it's not, of all of my concerns, it's probably lower on my list, I guess, is, is my thoughts on it. And again, I thought it was fairly uh, focused on my seeks recently. I don't see, I don't know if they see it as much in the next seek Nova seeks, but yeah. Okay, so uh, moving on to taxonomic assignments, uh, we're going to talk about reference-based approaches. So this is you take uh, reads, you want to get taxonomic assignment. How how do we do that? And I split this into sort of two major approaches. So this first approach is an all reads approach. So the idea is you take all your reads and for every single read you try to really map it to a genome and you try to assign taxonomy to every single one of your reads even though you're not going to you that that's the attempt that you're trying to do okay so this is going to be tools like kraken and centrifuge we're going to talk about those uh so that's difficult in that some of those same problems i talked about earlier so lgt is a problem in that case if it's a repetitive dna obviously you're not going to be able to map that fairly well uh, and then you're going to have a lot of reads that just don't map to the database. And so they don't have homologs. And so you're not going to be able to assign taxonomy to those. Okay. But there's another way to talk about taxonomic composition within a metagenomic sample, and that's a marker based approach. Right. So instead of trying to annotate all of your DNA, you only use some of the DNA, some of the reads to figure out the composition within a sample. So for those, uh, you have to define what those markers are, and it's dependent on those choice of markers. So that sounds a little abstract, so I'm going to hammer it down a bit more to what, I'm, what I really mean. So for marker-based approaches, there's sort of a, a few different angles. One, you could do this like single gene approach. You could actually extract, say, a 16S gene or a CPN60 gene or other universal genes, and you could actually you know, use that data, process it through Chime, and actually define taxonomy that way. Now that's not really a great use of your, all your sequencing, right? You just spend a lot of money on metronomic sequencing. So it's usually, you don't see that that often. Uh, and what you see instead a lot of is sort of using multiple different markers. And so one approach is this MOTUs approach, which uses 10 universal single copy genes and, and determines tax, tax on me that way. And then uh, this other approach, I'm not sure why the font sizes are all over, all over this place, is Metaflan, which is probably the most popular that uses this idea of clade specific markers. Okay. But just get this in your head that Manaflan is not trying to annotate all the reads. It's just using specific markers to then identify, to figure out taxonomy within, within your sample. So I'll just talk about Metaflan for a bit more. So Metaflan, if you've never heard of it, comes out of the uh, Curtis Hutton Howard's lab. It's on its fourth iteration at this point. It's very popular, uh, especially I would say in human microbiome studies but you do see it applied across other environments as well. So I just have some notes here. It's a lot of text, I'm sorry, but it's, I mostly just extracted it from the most recent paper to get a handle on what this means. But what they start with is they combine, um, they make a gene catalog essentially, and they combine 1 million, they state, bacterial and archaea genomes. 25% of those genomes are from, from sort of traditional isolate culturing or single cell sequencing. And then they actually use now, 75% of those genomes are actually derived from metagenomically assembled genomes, okay? So sort of, as you'll see later, you have to take metagenomically assembled genomes with a grain of salt, but they, they start with, with all those genomes. They then group those genomes into different bins. So you can sort of think of these as, as species, they call them species level genome bins or SGBs. So instead of worrying about taxonomy and all of that, they basically just use a percent, a 5% genomic identity, just meaning that they, if the genomes are within 5% of each other across the whole thing, they collapse them into, uh, into one of these bins. They then have 22,000 known SGBs, meaning they, they know what the taxonomy is. And then they have 5,000 unknown SGBs uh, where they don't have a taxonomy label, but they just, you know, they, they give them an identifier. Okay, so from there, then they extract essentially these markers. And so what they're looking for is particular genes or markers, we'll just use the term genes because it's more easier to think about, that are unique to that specific SGB uh, and that is uh, always found within that SGB. Okay, so you have a group of genomes at the species level. They essentially look for any genes that are always found in that and are also unique to that species. And they use those markers 
as, as an approach to then call your data. So this is all done ahead of time by the developers. And then for every SGB, they, you know, they have anywhere from sort of like 10 to 200 different genes that they can look for in your data to, to say that this SGB is there. So then that's all done in the background. Essentially now what you do is you come in with your data and essentially your metagenomic reads are then just searched against their list of markers using bow tie, which is really fast. Uh, and then they do a bunch of filtering and normalization to then produce your taxonomic profiles. So does that sort of make sense for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, lastly, it is limited to bacteria and archaea. They, I think back in version three or two, they dabbled with viruses for a while, but I see they've sort of, I think, given up on that approach. Um, so if you're interested in phage or viruses, this doesn't help you. If you're interested in microbial eukaryotes, this doesn't help you. Uh, so just, just understand that, that approach. Okay, so we'll come back to Metaflan a little bit and compare it to this other approach. But the other major approach, approach is an all reads approach. And this is again, where we're searching all reads against a large database. Uh, and so there's quite a few tools out there. I would say the most well-known one is probably Kraken and, and its partner Bracken. Uh, you might have also heard about Centrifuge or Keiju, uh, and these are still coming out to this day, but all these are essentially sequence similarity matching tools, um, and they use different um, computational approaches to make this faster or more sensitive. In almost most of these cases, they use a Kamer-based searching strategy, and I'll just briefly cover that just so you sort of have a foundation of what that means. And they use some sort of often a lowest common ancestor approach for assigning taxonomy. And I'll describe that as well. So for Kamer-based approaches, the idea is you have your database of genomes. You take you know, one of your genomes and you just split it up into fragments of overlapping length. Okay, so for this particular case, we split them into five. And so this would be a five mer. okay? So Kamer is just representing, you know, the fact that you're going to split it into certain lengths. And when people develop the tools, they'll basically, you know, explore the different lengths of Kamers to see which is most optimal. So they they divide it into these Kamers, and then and then wow, I really skipped over a whole bunch there. Uh, and then you, you, it seems like it produces a lot more data, but from a computational approach, it actually allows you to quickly search. So what happens is like, say if you're using a Kamer five. When they search for Kamers, they look exactly for that five, okay? If you use a long Kamer of say 11, like 11 mer, you'd have to have all 11 nucleotides exactly the same. And then, yep, sorry. Verify, so this is all on the database of genomes that you have yet, yeah, not on your reference sequence. That's really good. Sorry, I shouldn't, I should have clarified. So this is all on, you know, you have a big database of genomes that you're starting with and you're optimizing how you represent that data before you, you do the comparison. So this is all done sort of ahead of time building the database. Good question. Um, anyway, the biggest thing to understand about Cambers is that it does allow very fast matching, okay? It's way faster than something like BLAST, which allows uh, you know, missing nucleotides or insertions, deletions, right? It's looking for exact matches, which we can speed up using interesting computational approaches is how I'll describe it, okay? Um, and the reason I'm talking about this is that most of these tools, and that's how they're really different than something like BLAST or other approaches that they use a camera based strategy, okay? Now, I'm not gonna get into the more details of it, but then they basically use multiple camers then to your sequence that you give it to say whether that's a good hit for this particular um, genome. Once you sort of get that sort of, you know, threshold of enough Kamers and then you define a hit, then you're sort of left with, um, you know, assigning taxonomy to it. And so this is just showing sort of the basics idea of a lowest common ancestor approach. And so what it's showing is like different taxa, and this is, could be a phylogenetic tree, but usually it's just a taxonomy tree, right? So we can group things into their, uh, at a genus level would be here, or at the family level would be up here. 
And now because you know you have your short 150 base pair read or whatever long length it is, you're going to get multiple hits to different genomes, right? And so depending on how you threshold that, uh, you're going to find that, hey, maybe you have hits to one genome, you have hits to another genome. So what do I call this, right? Do I call this an E. coli? Do I call it Salmonella enterica? Do I call it, you know, Salmonella or just Escherichia? So wh what do I, what do I call it? And then a lowest common ancestor approach is just saying, I will take the lowest point in the taxonomy tree where I can cover both the things that I've said were significant hits. Okay, so this is a bit of a generalization and there's different flavors of how to do this lowest common ancestor approach, but that's the general approach used by many of these tools. So in this particular case, since we had a hit here and a hit here, we would call it at the family level that we have assigned this particular read down to enterobacter CA, because that covers both of those. And it says, I don't know which one it is below those. Okay. Yeah, question in the back. Um, so with Chime, like say we were using naive Bayes, um, and it's sort of, <laughs> the, the same fundamentals are what define how far down in taxonomy that you can put a label on something. It, it's because of the same fundamental problem. It's not strictly, um, a lowest can common ancestor approach though. Yeah. But it, it, fundamentally, it's the same rationale about why you, you can't push it any further down, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, and then uh, just to try to explain Bracken, which is really always fun. Uh, so after Bracken, the authors state you should use Bracken. Um, and essentially, what it does is it helps refine your taxonomy assignment. So Kraken does this sort of really fast searching. It does uh, does this lowest common ancestor approach. But the problem with this lowest common ancestor approach is you can imagine that if you sequence a lot of different species, right, within a, within a group, and you try to assign taxonomy, the more you sequence below it, the more reference genomes, which you think is a good thing, it actually sort of restricts how far down you can assign taxonomy to it, okay? So what Bracken tries to do is it tries to correct for that and push your uh, estimates of what taxonomy exists back down the tree so you get better sort of more higher resolution uh, taxonomy assignment. So what's showing here is that, okay, if we had Kraken, which is in blue, right? There's multiple, uh, what is this? Okay, mycobacterium, and it might actually put quite quite a few of our reads like higher up in the tree, those reads to its proper genome. And how does it do that? Well, it uses a Bayesian approach, but it essentially uses the idea that if you have certain taxa in your sample, you should be able to say, okay, well, I already know that this taxa really is for sure. Okay, we have this species A, we know it's here. And now we can just start adding some of those reads that just got placed higher up because we didn't have a good enough resolution. And we'll start to bin them into this genome because we think it, it, it actually, they belong there, okay? So it's an estimate to sort of help refine that so you don't get all of your reads going higher up in the tree. The take home message is that you should run Bracken after Kraken if you're using the tool uh, and then it helps you know, improve species abundance in the sample. Okay, so just backing up a bit, we talked about Metaflan, we talked about Kraken, uh, and there's lots of variances on both of those tools. So which one is best? This classic question that my lab tends to ask. Uh, and so this is a difficult question to assess. It depends on the database you're using. So often different tools use different sets of genomes, right? Some bigger, some smaller, some curated, some more refined. Um, it depends on how you're testing, right? So people use different models and simulated communities. It depends on the cutoffs for each of the tools. It depends who you ask. <laughs> so if you go through it, I could, I used to show all these papers where basically every tool shows that theirs is the best, which is always fun. Uh, and then it really depends a bit on this underlying approach, right? So this idea of like Franken and Metaflan, 
their target is the same, right? We want to know taxonomy composition, but they are quite distinct, different views on what you're trying to get, right? One is saying this is the taxonomic composition. The other one is saying, how many reads can I annotate? And so there's a bit of a variance on how we describe uh, a taxonomic composition. I will, yeah, and I won't go further, but there, yes, I will go further, so why not? Uh, so what I mean by that, just in, in, in real terms, is that if you think about taxonomic composition, you can think about it in two major ways. And there's a nice paper from Rob Knight's group about this. One is counting cells, and one is sort of counting like DNA and genome, okay? So if you use Kraken, and we're taking an all reads approach, you can imagine a larger genome, right? We're gonna sample more of it. So we're actually measuring sort of the amount of DNA in that taxonomic composition, right? So if a, if a bacteria has a genome that's twice as big, it'll show up as, you know, sort of twice as much in our, in our stack bar chart. Whereas Metaflan uses a, uh, you know, a marker-based approach. And so it doesn't have that bias due to genome size. It's sort of measuring a single marker or multiple markers, but a single copy is within a genome. And so at that point, you're sort of counting cells, okay? So one is really sort of counting numbers of genomes or cells, and the other one's counting sort of the size of the genome. Yeah, yeah, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like say between say a crack and a metaphor. Only if you want to go insane. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I would never shot. No, I would never say you shouldn't. Um, the reality is, is you'll you'll get pretty different results. Uh, it may be good for your own sanity, but I'm not sure if you'll be able to turn it into something cohesive. Now, what I was going to show, I guess, and I, I try to cut out a lot of this, is that we did do this comparison. Robin did this comparison, which was a huge rabbit hole, and it went just nuts. And you can check out the paper to see, again, we try to want to find the best. And it, it, of course, it depends is the big answer. Um, but the, the the one thing we really wanted to show, and I think is... The, I sort of knew it ahead of the paper was that Metaflan, and so Metaflan 4, of course, the paper, we just put it out on Metaflan 3, so Metaflan 4 just came out afterwards, so I guess what I'm talking about is Metaflan 3, but there is some key differences, and so for Metaflan 3, it's it's fast and low computational requirements, so you could probably run Metaflan actually on your laptop. Uh, it's That's really nice. Very simple bioinformatics setup. You would install it you could get it working done all in a day. It's fairly good for well-characterized where we have good reference databases. So really good sort of for like human microbiome studies. And because of that, we see pretty good precision. So if it says something is in there, it, it's probably in there. There's, and there's not too many false positives. Uh, where it suffers is some on recall, right? So finding all the organisms in a sample, all the taxa, especially for environments that aren't well characterized, right? So we're talking about soil, we're talking about our dolphin guts or something. Um, something where we don't have a lot of great reference genomes will suffer on that recall. And so I don't think I have the plot in here, but essentially there is one plot that where we show, you know, you take a particular sample, like a soil, uh, simulated so a soil, 16S showed around, oh, I don't even remember the numbers. It was like a hundred or so ASVs, okay? And then crack and spit out by default with its default parameter, like something ridiculous, like a thousand AS, or a thousand different species. And then Metaflan said there was like 10, right? So like, those are like non-compatible numbers. Like this is like a basic thing. Like how many things are in my sample and you're getting, you know, at the time Metaflan showing like 10, if you did six nest sequencing, like maybe a hundred and then, cracking with default parameters was spitting out like some crazy number. So obviously with say soil, with Metaflan 3, we were like not satisfied with that. We're like, okay, we know there's more than 10 things in here. It's, it's really falling over at this point. Maybe it's better with Metaflan 4, so that'd be great. Um, and then so we, we talked about that in the paper and then with Kraken 2, uh, we show that it's you know probably a bit better for environmental samples where they're not well characterized. And the big thing that Robin really explored in that is this use of a confidence cutoff threshold. 
And I think it's in the tutorial a bit, maybe a description of it. Um, but essentially the default is zero with Kraken. And then we basically show that that's probably a bad idea. So that leads to a lot of these false positives. And if you increase that threshold sum, then you remove a lot of that false positives and a lot of that noise. Now picking an optimal cutoff is not perfect, of course. And so that's, that's up for grabs. Uh, and then the other big thing is if you're using something like an all reads approach, say like Kraken or Centrifuge or something, you know, the bigger your starting database is really the better. Yeah. So more comprehensive, as big as you can go really helps things. And as big as you can go really comes probably down to the time you have to build the database and your computational resources you have. So for Kraken, they have different versions, but often what they'll do is they'll load the whole database into RAM, right? Memory in your machine. And so for your personal laptop, you know, you might have 16 gigs or 32 gigs. These databases are large, like 800 gigabytes, a terabyte of, of space. And so that, you know, you're not gonna do that on your laptop. You need access to significant computational resources to do that. Okay. Yes, questions here and then in back, yep. No, so, uh, and actually it's a good point. I don't think I talk about uh, contamination at all, unfortunately, um, but it would be considered something you would do post this step. Yeah, and so there is a few different approaches out there. Well, we haven't used a ton of them. So the idea is, hey, okay, you, you sequence something, uh, you've run some negative controls and you show that maybe there's this, you know, sequencing reagent contamination or some low level thing that, that is in your negative control. How do I remove it from my real samples, right? And so I've seen everything from the basic approaches. I just identify those taxa and then I just take them out of the sample you know, pretty crude, but I guess it works unless it's like a major player in your sample. Uh, and then there's more elegant tools out there uh, called one, the one that pops in my head is Decontam, uh, which is like an R package, which lets you take those negative controls and then um, do a better approach to try to remove those. I don't have a ton of experience with them personally, um, but yes, it exists out there, but that would be considered something to do Post this step, yeah, yeah, sort of in a filtering. Yeah, question down here. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I mean, that's to be honest, that's good, right? <laughs> um, that's what we typically see. So we will often run our negative controls, uh, and we get asked a lot why we don't always run negative controls, like at the IMR. Um, and the reality is we, we, we don't have like any reads in those, in those bins or they're super small amounts, right? Like talking like 10, 15, 20 reads, maybe a hundred reads max across certain things. So again, unless you're really, you know, focusing on the rare microbiome, it, 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 for us, I guess we don't worry about that much, but we don't see it that much of a problem, but there could be I'm always going back, right? There, there could be situations where it's still good, right? So we always do native controls for extractions just to view like amount of DNA in those native controls. Sometimes we'll sequence those, but typically we don't see that much. But again, like if you're doing a very, you know, low biomassing, like you're doing say John's placenta microbiome, right? Like, I mean, that would be a good thing to, to, to check out. Okay, let's move into function. And uh, as always, I'm slower than I expect, but that's good. Okay, so we're talking all about taxonomy this time. Um, we're gonna talk about function and about, you know, what, what does that mean? And I just wanna cover some real basics about what I mean by function because it means a lot of things. So by function, microbial function, we could be talking about really general categories, right? We could be talking about, you know, does my microbe photosynthesize? Does it do nitrogen metabolism? Does it have glycolysis? Um, or we could be talking about really specific functions like annotating a single gene as a particular enzyme, right? A particular type of genes. 
And so there's this hierarchy almost kind of like hierarchy and taxonomy from very precise things at the gene level, annotating it with a particular function. You could even think about domains all the way up to very general pathways, okay? And what's even more fun than that is that there's lots of different types of functional database, data, functional databases. And so I sort of allude to that a little bit here. If we want to take, talk about annotation, we can go through a whole history of these. Uh, things like COG, which are clusters of orthogonous genomes, have been genes have been around for a long time, but they haven't been updated forever. There's a system called Seed uh, system, which is the front end on that is a tool called MGRAST, which, as far as I know, still exists where you can upload your data. Uh, PFAM focuses on protein domains. UNIREF has really become, I would say, the most comprehensive and often the backbone of a lot of tools out there. And essentially, it's just a uh, a clustering of genomes of genes at particular identity thresholds. So within UNIREF, they have UNIREF 100, which would be 100% identical. UNIREF 90, saying they're 90% identical. Uh, UNIREF 50, 50% 50 identical, okay? For a lot of those, we don't have an annotation to say functionally what they're doing, but it's great as a starting way to have a, a, a gene catalog. And the other nice thing is there's lots of mappings from UNIREF to other classification schemes. So you'll see mappings from UNIREF to EC numbers, which are found in the KEG database. The KEG database is still pretty popular, even though it's been under a licensing fee for quite a while, but you'll still see people talk about KEG orthologs, KEG pathways. Um, if you've seen one of those nice, you know, uh, pathway metabolomic and it's sort of pathways with, with things highlighted over it. Often that's a keg uh, pathway. Uh, and then MetaPsych and, and keg are probably the biggest competitors with MetaPsych, I would say, becoming the more popular option now. Uh, and so it's primarily thought as an alternative for keg or a replacement for keg. And so you'll often see a lot of uh, systems mapping to MetaPsych at, at some point. Uh, I guess I didn't talk about the EC system or enzyme classification. You'll often see EC numbers, and those are found within, you know, KEG or MetaPsych. EC numbers are these guys, right? So enzyme classification, and then they're followed usually by a numbering scheme, and then a, and then a, you know, a definition for those. There's not enough time to go about through all these different databases, but I'm just giving you the highlight that there's lots of different databases out there. You can often map between them. I didn't talk about gene ontology, you know, the Go, uh, which you've probably heard about as well. That's another system out there, and you can sometimes map from particular uh, genes to the gene ontology. For annotation systems, now there's quite a few things out there as well, right? If you have your data and you want to get functions, how, how would you go ahead and annotate? There are some web-based solutions out there. So you can upload them to EBI's metagenomics server called Magnify. Uh, I don't know if NCBI has one anymore. MGRAS was a popular one back in the day. I'm not sure how well it works. IMG slash M allows you to upload data and get back profiles. I would say, uh, like most online systems, uh, they're not too bad, but they, they are a bit restricted in what you can do with it. And then that you're at the mercy sort of of waiting for them to do the annotation for you. But a nice one-stop shop. Uh, Megan has been around since the earliest days in microbiome, and I don't know what version they're on now. I don't personally use the tool, but it's another graphical option out there that you may want to explore. Uh, I think they're in like version four or five. Has anybody, anybody used Megan before? Anyway, it exists. It's, it's cool. <laughs> it's nice. Uh, and then there's lots of sort of what I would say local-based systems, right? Like things that we're going to run today uh, on, on a server that you would have complete control out of, uh, of how, to, how to operate those. Uh, there's a lot of different systems out there. Um, I mentioned Carnelian. Human 3 would also probably be I would say the biggest pipeline out there. So this is also from Curtis Huttenhauer's group. Uh, I'll briefly describe it uh, at a fairly high level. Uh, but then there's also, I would say a lot of people still just sort of homebrewing their own approach for functional annotation because there's so many different databases and there's so many different sort of things you wanna do that you'll see people just doing some sort of search against the database that they're most interested in and, and sort of you know, homebrewing it themselves. 
And so, you know, I, I call this microbiome helper. Um, we've used, we use Humon quite a bit in our lab. And then we've also just put together uh, a pipeline that uses MM seeks to do that, that searching and then does some normalization after. Okay. Okay, so challenges in functional annotation are very similar to the ones with taxonomy. Um, they're partial gene fragments. So a lot of time we think about function, we're thinking about like a whole protein, right? But if we're operating on raw reads, we're not even getting a whole gene, right? We're getting 150 base pairs of a gene, right? That's 50 amino acids. That's, that's, that's hard to call something definitively this function when it's only, you know, a fifth or a sixth of a whole gene. Um, you get lots of things across different uh, types of organisms. It's still really large databases, both on the database side and your sequence. And then there's different sort of normalizations we have to take into account maybe to help correct what we spit out into our table. And the, the two big ones I wanna just talk about here is, uh, gene length and inferring modules from pathways. So gene length is just this idea that, hey, if we have a gene that's twice as long, we're gonna, again, by chance, sequence it twice as much, right? But usually we wanna count those genes as individual chunks. And so often you'll see in many of these pipe, pipelines, a normalization to account for gene length. So they know that particular gene length and they'll just essentially divide your count by that gene length as a normalization step. So you're not counting really long genes more so than, than short genes. Uh, and then the other big problem is, you know, inferring module pathways um, from different organisms. So this is the idea of, you know, you can have genes annotated and we often wanna group those into larger pathways to say, hey, is this particular pathway present in my sample? And it's very difficult then to differentiate whether that pathway is all encoded in a single organism versus you know, across multiple organisms. And also to even for whether that pathway is completely covered or not, or whether only part of the genes in it are covered. So the key steps of functional annotation pipeline is you know, some sort of searching. So as I mentioned before, BWA, Bowtie are very fast, but they're limited to DNA space. And then uh, what we'll see come in here if we're talking about function is we tend to focus a lot more on proteins. And because of that, we'll use tools like Diamond uh, and MM62. So they're actually a bit slower than the mappers, but they're much more sensitive because it's in, it's in protein space. So you can find more distant homologs. And also, what else I want to mention there? Oh, yeah. So you could do this with BLAST, but obviously BLAST would just be way too slow. And so you'll see approaches like this do it quite quickly. Um, yes, and then comes down to database, depending on whether you're talking about comprehensive or, or more focused and large databases are good, but depending on you know, what you're interested in, this is where you don't really need to have you know, the biggest database ever if you're particularly focused in a certain area. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, like if you're interested in virulence factors, right? And you can focus on a virulence factor sort of database and not focus so much on, you know, say carbohydrate metabolism. Oh, I see I got myself ahead of myself with my slides. So there are these different normalizations. I just talked about normalizing genes by their length. You'll often see this reported sometimes in uh, reads per kilobase per million or just reads per kilobase. This kind of comes from RNA-seq land, but again, you'll see it reported as a count information, like a number, and that's been sort of normalized by gene length. There are other ways that go into determining what to call a function or not, and it's very detailed and I could go into it quite a bit, but you know, essentially taking into account you know, how similar your sequence is to the database, you can try to normalize based on that. You can uh, try to normalize by the average genome size of a sample. This is kind of an interesting thought experiment about whether if you have a sample here and a sample here, and genomes on average are much larger in this sample than this sample, then you'll actually you know, always find like more functions in, in this one. And so there's a tool called Microbiome 
microbe census, which tries to correct for that bias. We don't see it applied that much, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, and then often, you know, a lot of these tools like Human will do some sort of scaling factor just to give you sort of whole numbers or, or larger numbers instead of very small decimals. But just taking account that the things that you see, the number that you get may not be, you know, actual number of reads mapped to this gene. They're normalized through various processes. Um, okay, and then uh, pathway inference is probably the other big thing that, that you would see in something like human. And this is again, where we're trying to reduce essentially spurious pathways. So you can imagine if you have a pathway, my example here is in the second part, if you have, you know, 20 genes in the pathway and in your actual, you know, sample, only two of the genes in the pathway are found, do you, do you call that pathway like twice? Do you like call it zero times? Like, how do you figure out what the count of that pathway is? This isn't simple like taxonomy, right? Like, and so it could be that the pathway is not covered, right? Two out of 20 doesn't seem very sufficient. Maybe you didn't sequence enough and that all those genes are really there. So there's different approaches to try to, to essentially gap fill and remove spurious pathways. A lot of them will require a tool called MinPath, which has been around quite a while. And as far as I know, Human still relies on MinPath to help curate and trim off spurious pathways that shouldn't be counted. Again, Tego message here is that pathways are sometimes a bit of an approximation from the the basic genes encoded in those pathways. Okay, um, moving right along. Uh, so this is Human. Um, and so, you know, it's a very popular tool. Uh, and so, you know, I just thought I'd present the, the major steps here and sort of how it does its searching, just to give you a, a flavor for it. So the idea here is that it has sort of two major searches going on. So you have your input here, and what they do initially is that they screen, you know, your reads first using their Metaflan tool to say what taxa are present in your sample. And then based on those taxa, they essentially then can take the genomes representing those taxa in their database and screen your reads only against those genomes. Okay, they do that with bow tie, which we know is really fast. Uh, and then after that, they're left with all the reads that you know didn't map to one of the genomes that they think is in there. And for that, they do the sort of slower translated search with, uh, I believe they use diamond, unless they've converted to MM seeks. Uh, and then they do that search against all of UNREF, and then they combine the results together. Um, why would they do this two-stage approach? It's mostly speed. It, it speeds up their process a lot because to do this translated search on the whole UNREF database is really slow. And so doing this initial search really helps speed things up. The other thing it does is it gives you a stratified output. And so we'll talk about of this a little bit, mostly just because it's dear to my heart. Uh, and we've developed some tools around it. And I'm a big sort of proponent of, of using this information. So if we think about functions, we can, you know, annotate a particular, you know, function. So this is an example coming out of human two. So they've identified that this particular UNREF90 cluster is present in your sample, okay? They have a gene name for it, IMP dehydrogenase coming from that, come from the UNREF database. And then they give you this count information so this would be RPK, say it's 600. So that's in one sample. So that's how you can view that function. And you would have you know, your list of functions in a table by your samples and, and you're all set, right? And that's great, that's cool. Uh, and then, so people will often do that for functions. They'll, they'll do this measure of functions with all their table, or with a table of functions. And then you know, they'll also do their, all their analyses on a table of taxa uh, but they don't often join the two. They sort of just like do them separate, but we know they're really connected, right? So the nice thing about human, uh, which I like, is that you can get the stratified output. So instead of just getting that total, you know, functional amount, they'll actually give it to you as a breakdown. So you'll get a breakdown of what taxa contributed that function. And then there's always this sort of unclassified amount 
which just adds up, you know, we don't, we don't know what tax is there. Now, this is a beautiful output from, because I think I stole this from Curtis's group. Uh, the reality is, is this unclassified proportion is really high for all their output. So like this breakdown would be beautiful, but in reality, when you look at their functions, it's usually like one or two things. And then like, like 90% of that function would be unclassified. So we didn't really like that in my lab. And so that's why we sort of homebrewed our own approach outside of Humo to try to improve that stratified output. Uh, the other thing you'd get from Humon is like pathway information. And so this is just showing a metacyte pathway. And then they'll give you sort of two different approaches to this. They'll either give it to you as a coverage, just saying whether it's covered or not, a one or a zero, but they'll also give you abundance information. And so this comes back to how they, what they call a pathway, how do they calculate this, this number, okay? But then you can take those pathways and, and do analyses on those. So coming back to the stratified output, like why does this matter? And I'm, I'm nearing the end here, so this is good, uh, is that you know if we just talk about a particular single function, so this is just function X, and we looked at that across say five samples, we might see very little variation in that function, right? And without taking into account you know, what tax that contribute that function, we're sort of left in the dark about you know, what's going on in the community. But if we take that stratified output, we can actually then, you know, visualize and count how different taxa contribute to, to this function. And this is highlighted a bit in this paper of ours, but it's also highlighted in the, I think it's the Human 3 paper. Um, but this idea is that, you know, we can get different situations where we have, you know, uh, situations where we have a lot of different taxa contributing fairly evenly to a function which is okay. We have this situation over here where all of a sudden we see really different taxa contributing this function, which is pretty cool. And if you contrast just B and C here, right, those are telling really two different stories. B is just like, okay, it's conserved across taxa, kind of boring. This is suggesting a bit more like, hey, maybe like this is really important to this community. Like we see the same amount of function and it's being contributed by a different thing. Maybe it means that this function is actually being selected for by the community because we always see it. This one's a bit more boring, right? So it's just a single tax of contributing most of that function. And again, we might have a situation down here where we have you know, a single replacement. So it's hard to tell you know, in this case whether it's just a difference in you know, what species is there versus you know, some sort of selection pressure. But I've been really going on about this for a while, just that this information can be leveraged quite a bit. So there's different ways to sort of Think about that data, and there's not many tools out there that will actually handle the stratified output. You can get these tables, but then like, how do you visualize it? What do you do with that? And so we have been developing this one tool called Jarvis. It's not perfect, it's a little buggy, <laughs> um, but it runs in our studio. And the idea though, is that, you know, it gives you a fairly easy way, if it works perfect, uh, to view, visualize essentially the connections between your samples, sample groups. So this is Crohn's disease versus non your taxa, which are you know, found in those different sample groups, and then the functions you know, contributed by those different taxa, right? So the nice thing is, you know, so you might find, and the, your choice of what pathways or functions to visualize comes down to you know, how you wanna filter the data. So maybe you've done some differential abundance testing ahead of time, maybe you just took the most dominant, whatever it is, but it's nice in that so you can find particular pathways, say this 7208, and see that it's contributed by you know, different taxonomic groups and then how that relates back to samples. So anyway, I think it's kind of cool, hoping it gets cooler, but uh, yeah, we're gonna, it's at the very end of your tutorial. So if you get there and you get to work, like, I don't know, I should give you like a bonus, a bonus prize or something. But anyway, uh, I'd hope to see more tools like this in the future. Um, okay, and then my last, uh, really last two slides uh, are just about specialized gene annotation systems. So we've talked a lot about fairly general functions, but really this is where metagenomics like gets blown open, right? You don't have to use human, you know, three as a pipeline. There's so many different options and ways to think about metagenomic data to, to annotate it and to do different things with it, but even just to functionally annotate them. And so there's lots of different uh, systems out there. So I talked about virulence factors. There's a virulence factor database, right? So you can find, you know, 
compare the number of virulence factors between different samples. Uh, AMR is huge, right? Antimicrobial resistance, both in, you know, in, in people, but also in the environment, finding these genes. And so you'll see a lot of people using the CARD database uh, to essentially map you know, reads to the CARD database and try to come up with uh, you know, a catalog of different resistance genes in there. And that can be as simple as you know, you're doing your own little diamond search or there's more elegant systems being created to try to use machine learning and things to, to improve upon that, that catalog. If we're interested in carbohydrate metabolizing genes, you'll see often KZ uh, highlighted. It just gives us really nice uh, catalog and classification system for breaking down different types of carbohydrate metabolism. If you're interested in phage and prophage, we really don't do it any service much today in this talk, but obviously there's a lot of annotation systems out there for both uh, for primarily for sorting, you know, what we think is viral sequences versus not, and also trying to assign taxonomy to them. So I've seen vibrant, your sort of your finer marble, some really cool stuff in that area, you know, trying to link uh, phage or viruses to their host. So we're talking about phage, the bacteria host using like CRISPR spacers. Uh, and there's a lot of development in the biofmax world around that. Uh, and then there's just other large, genome catalogs out there. Uh, and you'll see a few of these sort of make a big splash. And sometimes it's, I don't see them used that much in practice, but they are pretty cool. So the one I highlight here is my last slide, this global microbial gene catalog. So they basically built, you know, this huge gene catalog. Like they took as much data as they could. They grouped them into different genes. They have, because a lot of this comes from that genomic data, they have the original source of where they found this gene. And so you can use these catalogs to say, hey, I have this really interesting gene. Does it map to it? Where else has it been found around the world? Uh, and do analyses sort of from that perspective. Okay, so I have talked for a straight hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I do not want to mention that. This is just a quick disclaimer. I always like to say this, that uh, we're talking about, you know, possible functions. These are like DNA level. We're not at transcriptomics. John's going to go in a lot more detail about this tomorrow. But remember, we're measuring, you know, DNA, right? So we're not talking about transcripts or metabolites. So function is kind of like this idea of potential function. And also that the DNA, depending on your environment, it might not be even from a living cell. DNA lasts quite a while. And so just take that into account when you're thinking about describing functions in a community. Like, is there any chance that a lot of those cells are dead and some sort of leftover historical thing? 